as a transcript and admit them all. Here we go. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Um, thank you so much for joining this call and a massive thank you to both Rod Whiting and Poppy who are giving up their time to be with us today. This talk is going to be about mixing me uh, media communication skills with medical consultation skills. And I know we've been dabbling in a lot of this, but we're going to get some people that do this full time rather than um, just getting the perspective of myself who does it for a hobby essentially so we're going to get the professionals to help us I hasten to add that's the media bit which is the hobby not the the medical bit um, as usual the disclaimers and disclosures and the the content herein is for the purposes of academic discussion and debate and the views expressed are not representative of any of the associated organizations that are over leaf over the page what I'd like to do is just run through what you guys are going to get from the next 90 minutes in terms of learning objectives. So we would really like you to understand the universal nature of communication and communication skills. Appreciate both the verbal and non-verbal communication nuances and how it's even more relevant in a COVID-19 world. Also the changes in terms of the healthcare ecosystem when we emerge from the pandemic these ways of working are going to be with us forever. Start considering the application and relevance of these skills to your medical training and consultation skills. Um, observe the power of social media for connection, human, communication, sorry, and building professional networks. And then I'd also like you to think about over the next 90 minutes how what you hear may influence you plan or how you plan, sorry, to practice medicine come 2026 when you will all be foundation year one doctors and then there's something else which we will pick up on future sessions with a more medical related um, focus to them in the sense that we will be looking in other sessions at the neurochemical and hormonal basis behind rod's wagon wheel of emotion so in terms of networks i would like to and the, the power of social media once this video loads, what I'd like to do is share with you how Rod and I uh, met. And this was five, just under five years ago. And it's only a two minute video. So I'm just gonna play this now. Start your day with Scott and Carla. The Breakfast Show. On BBC Radio Lincolnshire. Now, how easy do you find it to see a GP? Hospitals where the shortage of doctors is leading to a huge bill for temporary or locum staff. Well, there are moves afoot to try and persuade the Health Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, to back a new medical school in Lincolnshire. But what difference would that make? Well, Rod Whiting has been finding out. <laughs> It's Wednesday morning and A&E at Lincoln County Hospital is busy as ever. It's here on the front line where the shortage of staff doctors is most keenly felt. But all across the trust, managers are struggling to recruit and hold on to key people. The result is a ballooning deficit as locum and agency staff are hired in at significantly greater cost. Across the hospital, the next generation of doctors is getting a taste of what the profession holds in a special workshop. Kishan Reese is a junior doctor and senior teaching fellow who's part of a unique project to prepare and mentor aspiring medics in Lincolnshire, in effect growing our own doctors. These are students that have entered their application through UCAS and should they be successful they will be starting as medical students in August 2016. If people are going to be taking on £100,000 worth of debt they need to be fully aware and fully prepared of what they're letting themselves in for. Problem is once the talent has left the warm bosom of Lincolnshire getting it back is tricky. So the fact that medical leaders in the county are signing up to lobby the government for a medical school is going down well here. I think it'd be fantastic I mean a lot of the students in the course today 
are applying to Nottingham Medical School, which is one of the, the universities that sends their students to us. They Leicester send a lot of medical students to us as well. But certainly if there was a medical school in Lincoln, I think it would certainly help with the recruitment problem. Because there, you can make no bones about it, there is a recruitment problem. So I think it'd be great to have a medical school in Lincoln. Cool. So... Okay. Uh, there we go. So, in terms of introducing both Rod and Poppy, uh, Rod is a veteran broadcaster of 35 years, and I'm actually happy to use the term veteran, given the fact that he's been a military veteran as well for 14 years in the RAF. Um, in fact, broadcasting is his third career, uh, given that we won't hold this bit against him, that it was an estate agent, uh, or well, worked in real estate sales. We'll let Rod describe whether that is an estate agent, I'm not sure. But it's his experience as a journalist and his experience of conducting over 40,000 interviews over his career um, with the BBC, as you uh, saw how we met, that we will be really leveraging on and drawing upon today. So I really implore you to make the most of this opportunity. When we come to the Q&A at the end, have your cameras on, have questions. There's no such thing as a silly question. What youth ask there will be many other medical students across the country that will be thinking this. Um, so it's your opportunity to help them as well as yourselves. In terms of Poppy, who you've met already, um, but again, you haven't met Poppy completely in the sense that in addition to the asthma side of her background, which you know about when she came on that virtual consultations and the respiratory system session that we did, uh, Poppy is also a professional presenter of nine years with experience ranging from live TV, so interviewing and standalone, including corporate videos, as well as radio broadcasting and public speaking, such as in the Palace of Westminster. And as you will have known from when we met in the clinical consultation session, having spent most of her life with severe and brittle asthma and also being intubated four times and put into so medically induced comas, essentially, there was a point in her life where she had no idea that she would be in a position where she would be able to speak for others for a living when she was struggling to breathe as, a, as an asthmatic. So again, fascinating opportunity for the Q&A that we have to, to really pick Poppy's brains and leverage on some of that experience. Um, the other special guest that we've got who doesn't have a slide today, but we'll have a whole deck next week uh, is Amelia. Belle Trowell, who is going to come and talk to us about how she used social media to raise awareness of her mum's journey with stage four breast cancer. So uh, with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing and hand over to Rod. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, well, hello, good afternoon. Lovely to be here with you this afternoon. Um, can I just say that uh, I have lost a bit of weight since that video was uh, was taken. The camera never lies, does it? The camera never lies. And, and I guess um, I'm not alone in regretting since, since this whole pandemic business started that I didn't buy shares in Zoom uh, 18 months ago, but that's another story. Um, I, I think I could probably subtitle this chat to things I wish I'd told myself, my 20 year old, year old self, um, except my 20 year old self was an idiot and would have paid no attention. Um, 40,000 interviews, I think we worked out, Kishin and I just sort of did a back of the envelope calculation. We, we calculated, I've done about 40,000 interviews during my 30 odd years in, in broadcasting. That's a rough estimate, I wasn't counting. And not that time it, it itself is necessarily a, a sign of wisdom. Uh, <laughs> It turns out you, you actually need a master's degree to find out what it is you've been doing for 30 years, as I discovered quite recently. Uh, for the benefit of you guys, what's the relevance of 40,000 media interviews uh, to young medical students uh, starting out on uh, a completely unrelated careers? Well, thank you for the opportunity to explore this, except it's, it's not unrelated, uh, really, is it? Uh, communication is gonna be key to your careers, typically without stereotyping too much here, uh, as medical undergraduates, I mean, you're probably, it sounds patronizing, but you're probably far 
brighter, more articulate, highly motivated and competitive than many of the media students uh, I've ever taught. And that's not to decry them. It's just that the motivation I noticed when I spoke, when I interviewed Kishan that day, the young, uh, the youngsters that were coming in to be interviewed about potential careers in medicine, I couldn't get over just how uh, eloquent, articulate, motivated, uh, competitive they were. Uh, nevertheless, um, how you communicate with, with your seniors, your peers, uh, with patients and the wider public, I think is going to be key to your success. So with your permission, I'd like to just explore a few areas of, of my communication training that might well be relevant. And let me start with a question. I wonder what proportion of communication is based on what you say. And uh, you just shout, I don't know whether you have the ability to shout out here, but do shout out. Um, Absolutely, they do, yeah. Yeah, what proportion of communication is based on what you say? Anybody want to offer a percentage? This is on, on what you say. What proportion of communication is based on that? Anybody? Um, I'm to say 40, maybe. 40%? Any yeah. other anybody else? I can't hear anybody. Um, it's actually 93%. 93% of communication uh, is nonverbal. Uh, Professor Albert Mulrabian established that concept in his paper, The Silent Message, in 1971. He concluded that the interpretation of a message is 7% verbal, 38% vocal, in other words, the delivery, and 55% visual. Uh, in other words, what you say needs to be heavily supported by delivery and visual interpretation. You see, what people say uh, and what people see, I should say, when you, when you speak is actually very important. It's really important because what they see matters. Sorry, what was I saying? Um, apologies if some of this is blooming obvious, but it doesn't hurt to hold it up to the light, you know? Virtual communications uh, is, is something that's become quite, we were discussing this before you came on. This whole idea of, of, of Microsoft Teams, Zoom, I mean, 18 months ago, yes, we were doing it, but it, we, we weren't doing very much of it, were we? And I reckon when we, we estimated we've advanced a good five to 10 years. We've accelerated this process of, of uh, technology and use of technology. We were heading in this direction anyway, but we've just accelerated. We put a, a massive boost into it uh, to, to bring, I would think, 10 years forward. I mean, people like uh, grandparents would never have entertained the idea of using technology like this to keep in touch with their families, but they've embraced it through necessity. And that, I think that's where we all are. And when we look at the way that GPs are now communicating with patients, I mean, I'm, you know, the Ask My GP uh, app, which I dare say you've, you've all talked about, you probably used yourself. We're never gonna go back to sitting in a germy, GP surgery for 45 minutes or half an hour, whatever it is, waiting to be seen. I mean, yes, I mean, there will obviously be an element of that, but nothing like to the same extent we are now. You know, telemedicine is, going, is, is already starting to play a much bigger role in, in the delivery of medicine and consultation than it ever did before. And this has huge ramifications for uh, the medical infrastructure. I mean, you've all seen the way that emergency services now combine all of their, their headquarters into one. And you've got all of your emergency services now in one big building uh, that serves a massive community. Certainly, that's what I've seen. And, you know, I can see this happening uh, with medicine as well, as to a certain extent. We've seen it with hospitals. Uh, you know, local hospitals have fallen by the wayside and we've gone to much bigger establishments. But with virtual centres, I suppose we have it with one one one. But with consultations, I think there's such a, a huge chance and an opportunity for you now um, to, to really embrace this because you'll probably be giving your consultations through, vir well, almost certainly through virtual communications. Um, how much face-to-face -face will there really be in the end? It's so much more convenient without patients running up huge transport costs, having to move 50, 80, 100 miles to see a specialist. If you can, you can do exactly the same thing on a, on a computer screen. So huge uh, ramifications there. 
and it's here to stay for sure. Uh, the, I, right, let's get let's get across now to the disadvantage maybe of being on the screen. Um, I mean, it, it ages you terribly. I mean, I'm only 35, but I look much older on the screen. Okay, I'm kidding. 45, really. So here's where there's a, a, a corollary with a, a television studio and television presenting. And we've got a couple of TV presenters with us now. Uh, I hope we'll identify with this, but the virtual communication that you've already made is, it, it, for them, it's second nature, but will be key to your doctor, patient and colleague interactions. So what can we learn from our television friends? Well, think of your favorite TV presenters. Uh, they, they all, what do they have in common? Well, they all pretty much look presentable, don't they? Uh, they, they look well-groomed, smartly dressed, uh, well-groomed hair. You don't see many scruffy presenters and with good reason. You know, it's important to look the part, especially if you're going to be professionals. It's really important. Um, the other important thing that you'll see with, with television presentation and TV studios is the lighting. It's absolutely key. How, I mean, how many times do we see people being interviewed on television? They're being interviewed virtually and you can't see them because they, you know or you can only see one side of their face um so lighting is is incredibly important if you're going to be doing a lot of virtual work it's you know invest in some decent lighting uh you've already got a barrier between you and a patient by virtue of the fact that you're not in the room with them so you don't want to create additional barriers by being only half visible or your wi-fi being so bad that you're completely incoherent um, I've got, uh, I mean, I've got natural light in front of me, but I've also got a ring light. I mean, if I can turn it off, I don't know, it'll make a lot of difference. But you can see I've gone into a little bit of darkness there. And I've got different settings on the ring light as well. So I can make myself look a bit cooler uh, or warmer. Uh, look, I've been to Barbados, everybody. Uh, it's probably not quite as pronounced as it would be if it was dark, but it, it makes a difference. And in fact, if I just swing it round so you can actually see what I'm doing here. Uh, can you see that? So that's a simple ring light. Uh, I'm, I think the place to mount it is just above your computer or as close to the, uh, the, the camera eye as possible. If you have it too low down, especially if you wear spectacles, you see that ridiculous geeky look of, uh, of the computer screen in the lens of the, of the viewer and it just looks weird uh, and slightly strange. So Try and get it up above the, the screen so that it doesn't bounce off the, the lenses of your of your spectacles. And uh, I, I say, avoid um, having it to one side. You get a shadow on one side of the face or underneath it because it makes you look very sinister. You know, we've all played that game haven't we, with torches. Um, microphones, another thing to think about. I mean, some people, I think, Kishan, you have a, a camera, don't you? You have a standalone camera. And you actually set up different scenarios in your room depending mm -hmm. on what it is you're talking about, which is very 100%. clear. 100%. Very clear. It's interesting that you mentioned that, Rod, as well, because it's something that, for me, it was second nature in the sense that if I'm having to work in my environment and my, my home, my living space, do I necessarily want that to be projected? And I don't really mind in terms of the, the chaos that I work in because I quite enjoy it, but a lot of people haven't even thought about it at all. Um, so if you're a doctor and you're doing virtual consultations, of course, I wouldn't have this behind me because it would be quite probably obst obstructive and intrusive for the patient. But I, it's just that point that you made where when it comes to second nature, if you're in an environment that you know about it, how that transfers across. Yeah. What I hope the medical students will get from this is the opportunity to really everything that you're saying implement into their practice now, not in six years time. Absolutely. No, I, and I couldn't agree more. And it's, it's funny, but what were we all looking at when Kishin was talking there? Were we looking at Kishin or were we looking at, oh, ooh, what's he got on the wall behind him? What's going on? Oh, look, what's that in the corner of the room there? That's what we're interested in, isn't it? And you have to be really careful with backgrounds. You'll notice I put a neutral background up uh, behind me. Um, uh, is this because I've got pictures of something I don't want you to see? Um, not necessarily. Uh, it's very boring, actually. Uh, it's just, um, it's an old, you know, I'm in a summer house. Uh, so it's a picture of Guy Gibson and his dog, and it's really quite prosaic, but um, it's still a distraction. So I prefer just to have a neutral background. And if you're thinking in terms of, of when you go out into the workplace, 
uh, you're going to be working in, in, in virtual consultation in, in that sort of environment. You know, it's worth discussing with the office manager or practice manager or whatever to make sure you invest in the right technology. Lighting kits are remarkably cheap. That ring light I showed you, uh, 15 quid from Amazon. Now, you, you know, if you want to invest a little bit more, you could have, um, I, I can't remember the name, is it Niwa, something like that. They've but very professional lighting for about 120 quid. You can have proper uh, professional lighting and you can do what they call key lighting. So you'll have 45 degree angles to yourself, uh, a big strip of adjustable brightness and adjustable type of, of light. Um, with LED lighting in front of you. If you want to be really professional, you could have a, a, a light behind you as well to highlight your lovely hair. Obviously, a complete waste of time in my case. But uh, so, you know, invest in the kit. If you're, if you're going to set up that kind of environment, uh, it, you know, it's a worthwhile investment. Likewise, microphones, if you want, want you can get lapel microphones. If you've got a decent uh, computer, that won't probably be necessary, but it's something to think about. Right, I want to get on to um, the next sort of element of this, if you like, which is, what would you say, I'm going to ask a question now, and please do respond. What would you say is the most critical component of any important conversational presentation or contribution to a meeting? Anybody? And guys, you can put it in the chat and I'll read it out. You can come on camera and you can speak or you can WhatsApp me. So you've got three different options. Um, so the more you engage, the more you'll get from this. Body language we've had in the chat. OK, not wrong. But what would you say is the most critical component of any important conversation or presentation or contribution to a meeting? Eye contact. Yes, good. Yeah. Is that the most important thing? Tone of voice, expression from Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Yeah, these are all important things, and we're going to talk about these. Relevance. Okay, yeah, that's, that's good. But actually, the most important thing for me is preparation. Preparation is the first and foremost consideration before you do any kind of uh, public uh, chat. And by that, I mean something that's not um, outside your immediate circle of friends or family. If you're going to engage in a conversation, especially if it's an important one, you have to plan it, you have to prepare it. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. Um, like criminal suspects, everything you say will be used in evidence against you. So it's really important to take the time to think about what you're going to say, how you're going to say it, and why you're going to say it. Now, because I'm involved in the business of training, of course, as a trainer, I do a lot of mnemonics <laughs> and I'm not gonna be slow with it now. Uh, what's the best mnemonic for getting to talk about preparation? So I use the word prepare, okay. Uh, pre preparation, um, purpose is the first letter, isn't it? Why, somebody said relevance. I think it was Sarah said relevance, yeah. Why are you going to say this thing? Why, what, what, why are you going to make this speech? Why are you going to make this presentation? What is the purpose of this? You need to be pretty focused on that. Otherwise, you're going to meander all over the shop. Um, rule as the R, rules of engagement. Rules of engagement. What do I mean by that? Um, well, uh, is it outside, inside? Is it on Zoom? Is it in a large hall? Is it in a, a small room? What are the acoustics going to be like? Who else is involved in the meeting? What's on the agenda of the meeting? Uh, this is all very important information that you need uh, before you get involved in any kind of, of, of discussion. Um, the next e essential information obviously you've got to know what you're talking about so you're going to you're going to gather the evidence uh, all of the stuff that you need to be able to make the point you're going to make um, get the facts right because if you get them wrong then your credibility is gone in an instant uh, points the prepare i've got to think about it um points what points are you going to make okay you just need bullet points sometimes what people do when they're um, they're going to give a talk is they make copious notes. I always say to people who are going to be interviewed, don't come in with reams and reams of notes, you will get completely lost in them, you'll lose your way and you'll panic when uh, and what I always do as a training aide is uh, I see the notes in front of them and I take them off them uh, and then look at them as much as I say okay what are you going to do now and um, because if they become too reliant on them it's 
it actually works against your confidence as opposed to for it. It's amazing Rod, what your sorry, mind can take in. Sorry, to chip in. Sorry, Rod. I'll just say I will put my hand up to that. And I can remember a very rainy day in Lincoln County Hospital car park where I turned up with said notes. And you did. You took them off me. But you did it in a way that was very supportive and nurturing. And, you know, you've got to think about as well how patients would respond to that. So say, say a doctor was dismissive of the fact that a patient had loads of notes and they'd come prepared, which lots of people do. Lots of people say, oh, Dr. Google, aren't you great? You know, don't confuse my medical degree with your Google search, which I think is absolutely abhorrent. And we need to stop that kind of culture. But it was a fascinating. I just it, it remember I remembered that, that cold, wet day. We were outside in a car park, but it was the way you took the notes off me and built me up so that we could do a half decent broadcast. Um, and, so it, I I tell you what, it, and it was it was and I, I could see your confidence growing um, as you spoke. You know, it, it, it really was. It made a tremendous difference. So, yeah. Um, OK, what did we get? Uh, points and message. Those are the things you've got to consider. Um, a, prepare, we're on. Uh, a is for anticipate questions. Now, that obviously that's really important for an interviewee, but I think it's important for you as well. If you're going to get into a meeting or uh, a discussion with your boss, or a dis it could be a, a domestic situation, you know, what are the likely areas of discussion going to be? If it's an important conversation, what are the questions going to be? What, you know, you anticipate where this is going. It's really important so that you can prepare and be planned. It's not going to come as a terrible shock to you. Um, R, prepare, R is for risks. What are the risks? I was considering this. Uh, what are the risks for me this afternoon? And I, I thought, well, the risk is me saying something really inappropriate. You know, lots of young students here. And, uh, you know, I come from a different generation, different mores. I could put my foot right in it. So I've, I've told myself, just cut back on the silly humour because they may not get it. Um, so, yeah, what are the risks? Think about where you could go wrong. Um, and then finally, E. Now, normally, if I was talking to media students, it would be emotion. What is the emotional heart of the conversation topic that you're getting into? Because that's how you really connect with people at an emotional level. Um, but for you, I think uh, there's another E, which is probably more effective, which is empathy. Empathy is really, really important. Uh, it, it, unless unless you're, you have that ability to put yourself in, in somebody else's shoes. Can I tell you, as a 60 odd year old to a 20 odd year old, that is one of life's great skills, being able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. It will save you a lot of grief if you learn to do that well. Um, so empathy is important and tone is important. So getting that tone right, and I, 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 can, how can I use an example of that? I think we've all had examples of the, uh, the the snooty doctor. Yes, I know you've done your seven years of 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 you know education and training, and and you know you're a clever person. I absolutely get that. But if you talk down to me because of that, am I going to be distracted by that? Am I going to be taking in everything you say? Am I going to be angry, resentful when I've got all the other rubbish to deal with in terms of my health problems? You know, that's just that's just one example that comes to mind. So getting the tone right is important. Kishi. Oh, sorry, on that point, can I ask why do you think people do that in that environment? Because I know it's not intentional, but what do you think is going on in their uh, psyche or their uh, maybe lack of situational awareness in terms of to be to, because it's a consistent thing in medicine around the world. So why do you think that happened? Maybe Poppy's nodding. I mean, maybe Poppy coming from a patient perspective or anybody who's got any ideas. M was also on the call. Anybody who's got any ideas around this? Why do we think that medical professionals gravitate towards that sort of? Is it a place of safety? Is it a defence mechanism? What what do we think it is? Well, Poppy, Amelia, you've both had experience of of that sort of interaction i mean have you any observations on that happy to jump in so with regards to a doctor patient relationship something that i've experienced and i know emma's mentioned something similar before is instances where for example i can give you an example i've said oh my goodness you know my, my sleep last night was terrible i my asthma really tends to get worse of an evening and the doctor goes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are you taking your inhalers correctly? And by not 
acknowledging what I've said, it's practically dismissing, it's, it's ignoring. And the reason as to why, I don't believe it's always intentional. I believe it's the tick list of which medical professionals often believe they have to work to. I believe it's a pressure of time as well. I mean, a lot of appointments of which I've had over the years are emergency appointments or, or, or any GP type appointment is often very short uh, in terms of minutes. So I think it's time constraints. I think it's the tick list, the, the thought of a tick list. And perhaps it isn't just listening as well, but not actually acknowledging what a patient has said or anybody, you know, this isn't just doctor patient. Asking a question based upon what somebody has just said to you is so important. Otherwise you just go off a, onto a completely different track. So if you know, someone says something to you and you go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay, and then you ask something else, it, it, you lose the, the trust of the person that you're speaking with, you lose the engagement, and all of a sudden there's a total breakdown. And it doesn't matter if you even try and regain that trust afterwards, the person, whether it's a patient or an interviewee or an inter whoever it may be, will sit there, I know I have, thinking, you're not listening to me, you're not listening to me, I don't trust you, you're, you don't actually want to hear what I've got to say. So I think there's a few elements. I think it's time, nervousness, perhaps a tick list. And sometimes it might just be a case of not listening. Yeah, I, I completely uh, concur with that. And uh, and I can give you a, a, for instance, with broadcasting as well. Then I, I mean, I was, I've been guilty of this many times myself. All broadcasters are. I think Amelia will probably nod to this. Um, you know, you, you're 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 actually thinking about something else. Because with broadcasting, there's always something going on. You might have somebody in your ear um, and you don't hear what the person said to you. And you ask them the question that they've just answered. And it's a real no-no in broadcasting to do that. But it, it happens. We all do it. Uh, it's just one of those things. And I always slap myself if, if I ever do it. Yeah, so... I'm, I'm pleased we've spent a bit of time on that because it is important. I think, especially for your profession, you know, empathy and tone, really important. Uh, right. I want to get on to the next element of this, uh, which uh, some some of the other little asides for, for, for communication that, that I do talk to, to delegates about. Very important to stay calm. Um, you know, you're you're working at medics are working in a highly pressured environment, as we've seen over the last uh, you know, year or so. And uh, and so I can imagine things get pretty heated in those staff meetings. Um, but do try and stay calm because once you introduce anger or uh, once the temperature starts to rise, then, then communication suffers greatly. If you can stay calm, um, then you'll get a lot more done, a lot more agreement. Um, when it comes to questions, uh, if you're asked something in a meeting or uh, as a result of a speech or presentation or whatever, um, you've got three choices, haven't you? You can either answer the question, fine. Um, you can not answer the question, uh, in which case, where does that leave you? Does, why is he not answering the question? Does that make you look evasive? Um, whenever you see politicians ducking and diving, uh, answering the question, it's fairly obvious what they're doing, isn't it? Um, so not a good idea to to not answer the question. There are occasions when you won't answer the question. Things like confidentiality, data protection, um, you know, a couple of or when you just don't know the answer. If you don't know the answer, say so. Give a reason for not answering the question. There is another way of answering a question, and that is addressing the question. So you acknowledge the question you don't necessarily answer it and we're going to come on to something called bridging in just a moment um aim now we have a, a another mnemonic here you don't have to remember these but it's just useful to re way of rem remembering stuff uh, wise um i think it's always good if you can remember these things try and sound when you're in conversation try and sound warm uh, try and sound uh, intelligent and by that i don't mean you've got an iq of 150 uh, I just mean uh, authoritative, knowledgeable, um, communic communicable, <laughs> uh, sincere. So we're wise, sincere. Sincerity is so important. Uh, again, we're going, going back to what we've just been saying with Poppy. You know, if you're not coming across as somebody who's engaging, or if you're not interested, disinterested, then then that trust is gone. You just think, so why am I even bothering to have this conversation? So sincerity is important as well. 
And uh, the E, oh, we're back to empathy again, aren't we? Um, I think it's, it's really important. It's being empathetic with somebody, understanding the, the situation that that person's in, why they're coming from that particular point of view. I think it's also important to review what you've said after every important conversation to see how you could have done it better. Um, so if you've, you've been in a meeting and it hasn't gone quite to plan, well, why did that happen? You know, what did I say? What did I do? Was there some non-verbal uh, sign or signal that I sent off there that gave the wrong impression? Um, do you know what? Ask for feedback. Don't be afraid to ask for feedback, particularly at your stage in your life. You know, you're very fortunate that um, you, you are completely forgiven for making mistakes. You, know, you are expected to make mistakes at your, your stage in life. Um, for somebody like me, it's an old fool, um, but you're allowed to make mistakes. I mean, we are as well, but you know, what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Don't be afraid to ask for feedback. Uh, it's a really great way of improving very, very quickly. And most people will be happy and possibly honored to provide it. Uh, the business guru, a chap called Ken Blanchard, who co-authored the brilliant One Minute Manager, uh, he put it best when he said that feedback is the breakfast of champions. I just think that's a lovely saying, and it's absolutely true. Um, yeah. So, uh, right. Now, I just want to discuss another little tip, which we discuss a lot in my uh, media training sessions, which is the message sandwich. It's quite a descriptive phrase, um, but it's very useful. Uh, I, I can't take credit for it. It's a chap called Robert Taylor um, who came up with that media guru. Uh, but it's a lovely descriptive way of describing a technique which I think you'll find useful. I've already given you um, a, a message sandwich this afternoon, and I'll repeat it for you. Communication is 93% nonverbal. Professor Albert Milran established that concept in his paper, The Silent Message, in 1971. He concluded that the interpretation of a message is only 7% verbal. Uh, it's... 38% vocal in the way you deliver it, and 55% visual. In other words, what you say needs to be heavily supported by delivery and visual interpretation. Okay, so that's it, that's my point. But hopefully it was made a little bit more powerful by the way that I structured it. And the structure of points that you're trying to make is really important. And I just think that's a really effective way of structuring a point that you want to make, a key message. So you start off at the, at the top of your sandwich with uh, the, the essential message of what you're trying to say. And you need to do that in less than 10 words. Why less than 10 words? Well, because it focuses, it focuses you completely on what it is you're trying to say. So get that into the, into ten words, and you've immediately uh, you've you've communicated what it is you're you're discussing and what your main point is. Communication is ninety three percent nonverbal, and people think, "Whoa, really?" Right now, you need to back that up. You need to come up with evidence, proof of what you're saying, and uh, illustrations are a great way of doing it. Uh, examples is a good way, but in my case, I've quoted somebody. Professor Albert Mulran and the academic uh, uh, conclusions that he came to. And then the bottom part, so that's the middle bit, that's the evidence that you're supplying. And then the bottom of the sandwich is a repeat of your main message only in different words. So in other words, what you say needs to be heavily supported by delivery and visual interpretation. That's your message sandwich. And I, I promise you, if you use that technique uh, when you are wanting to do an important, I mean, yeah, I'm not suggesting you do that in every communication that you have, uh, but it's not a bad starting place, actually. You'll, you'll find that people will be much more impressed with what you're saying if you can get into that habit. And these, it, it's like any habits and it's like any behavioral change in life. It's all about habit. You, they reckon you're in a scientist, right? You need to do it for about six weeks for it to stick. Uh, I'm on a, a, a dietary thing at the moment. I don't believe in diets, but what I do now is uh, because I'm getting to that age where I have to worry about what I eat and drink. Um, I, uh, I don't drink alcohol for four days a week, but that means for three days a week, 
I can make merry. I don't, you know, consume whole bottles. And actually, I don't find a need as much because I'm only drinking three days a week. But I'm allowed to do that three days a week. And I'm allowed to eat what I like uh, within reason on that three days a week. But the other four days, I'm sensible. I don't drink coffee. I don't take alcohol. And I'm already seeing after four weeks, still got another two weeks, I'm, I'm starting to really stick to that behavior. So about six weeks to take these techniques and actually build them into your everyday psyche. Right, let me get on to um, bridging. Before I do that, um, there's three categories of interview. I always say this to people and uh, the broadcasters here will either nod away or they'll say, what are you talking about, mate? Um, but there are three types of interview and I, and I would group your communication in the same way. There, I would say about, I don't know, 40% of my the interviews I've done have been good interviews. But I don't mean from my perspective, I mean good interviews in the sense that they achieve what we wanted them to achieve and the person was able to make their articulate their points well. Uh, about 40% maybe. Um, about 20% of them didn't work very well uh, because of poor preparation. Um, just the person giving, uh, giving the interview really didn't know what they were talking about, uh, hadn't been well sourced, those sort of reasons. Um, and then the other uh, 40%, I think that's right, 30%, whatever, um, said too much. They just rabbited. They they didn't have structure to the, the, the points that they were trying to make. Uh, so I think it's important to just remember that. You, you can say too much. You can say too little. Uh, so it's that's why the bridging techniques and the and the message sandwich those are really good ways of of making sure you're hitting the the target. Uh, right, I just want to talk about bridging now. This is a really useful technique, particularly with with tricky conversations. We all have those. Um, so you might be in a meeting, and uh, they're going to discuss a new rotor plan. Okay, um, it's it's a uh, I don't know, it's a new rotor system in your hospital or in your surgery or whatever. And you've got reservations about this, okay? Uh, now, because remember, what will you be doing when somebody's doing something you don't like? There will be little signals going on. Your facial expressions, uh, the fact that you're not looking at the person that's, that's delivering this bad news. There'll be all sorts of things going on. And they might suddenly turn around to you and say, well, you don't seem very enthusiastic about the new rotor, Poppy. Uh, is this going to be a problem? And you think, oh, and suddenly everybody in the room is looking at you. We've all been there. We all know what that's like. So what do we do? Do we go on the scene? You're starting to feel really uncomfortable and you might come back aggressively because you're you're. You know, there's a bit of fear going on here. You might be angry. You might be, why was she talking to me like that? So you come back, you snap back, and straight away you're into that kind of conflict situation. So bridging is a way of getting you out of that situation. And so what you might do is say, well, well, thank you for, for asking me about this because, uh, I, look, I want to provide the very best care and support for my colleagues and patients. So I'm really keen to be able to work uh, you know, with whatever system is introduced. What I would say, now you can get onto your concerns. And what you've done there is you haven't be, you know, got aggressive or you, you're not uncomfortable, you're not phased. You've acknowledged the question. You've addressed the question but you're, you're now moving it onto your territory. You're keeping control of the conversation. It's a really important technique. I teach uh, and my delegates this one all the time, particularly politicians. Um, let me give you some other examples just so that you know, we can really ram that message home. Uh, useful bridging phrases. Uh, good question. Um, but what's most important, I think, for us to consider is one way of doing it. Um, you can, there's a way of actually not answering the question at all, but seeming as though you are. So you might, so somebody asks you that awkward question, you might say, well, keep in mind that, and then you're on to your point, the point that you want to make. And now you, you've not dismissed them, you've acknowledged, you've addressed the question, but you're now moving on to your territory. 
Uh, let, Rod, sorry, sorry, just on that point really quickly in terms of bridging and from a clinical consultations point of view, the biggest concern that I've seen with students over the years is people try to acknowledge it, but then forget because they're so wedded in the checklist. So the, the reason that this is important for everybody on the call to understand this is because we do it without even knowing. So Rod is giving you examples of how he trains people like politicians to do media interviews, which may well be hostile. But we, as medical professionals, often use these techniques without even knowing because we're thinking about something else or we're looking at something or we're, we're, we're thinking about the, what the most dangerous diagnosis is. So it's well-intentioned. But if we bridge and we don't go back to something when we said that we did, the pain and the hurt that that will call that, cause those patients, um, I mean, I, well, Poppy spoke and I don't know, um, what, have you got any thoughts on that? Don't want to put you on the spot, but um, as a patient, if you, I'm sure you've been in consultations loads where somebody's bridged and then moved on and completely forgotten about it. Um, you on mute though, I'm afraid. Well, I tell you what, let me just finish some of the phrases. I mean, I think it's an important point you're making. Um, I, 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 but keep in mind that I'm not sure that's the case uh, is, is a good way of, of perhaps coming back to that sort of thing. Or yes, Cushion. And that said, and then you're, you're agreeing with, I'm agreeing with you, but I'm now moving the agenda on. I mean, I, I listen, I, I totally understand what you're saying. And, but I'm, and I'm not suggesting that this is necessarily a way of ignoring um, uh, the question that's come in. Look, if you can answer the question, answer the question. No, I completely but, agree. But, but, but it, I think people, um, the perception is, it's as if we've ignored it as a clinician or dismissed them. If we make something like that promise, say we're going to come back to this in a bit, Em, and uh, then I completely forget about it and then move on and, and then that patient leaves the room, then that sits and that festers. I'm, I, I don't know, does it? Maybe it doesn't, Em. What, you're no, no, it, does. Ready. it most definitely does. And you find yourself um, losing faith and it actually leaves a template with you that you then translate across any other contact that you have um, my pet hate is neurologists. I yet have to find a neurologist who actually treats you like a human being. Um, but that's just me due to the cumulative experience that I've had. So personally, I would rather have the, the question where somebody sits there and says, mm, I see what you mean, and takes that pause within a conversation that you understand if you uh, any relationship is a two-way thing you have to give the other brain time to process what you have just said to them and give them the space i believe um in nancy klein's time to think theory where you pass the baton to them so you must allow somebody to think but alternatively you can't just filibuster your way through these things sadly politicians think that's the way to get through things. And, and I appreciate that Rod must be exceptionally frustrated with dealing with them. However, in a, in a clinical setting as a patient, there's nothing worse than being filibustered to. I would rather somebody take that pause or somebody say, yeah, we've got to think about this. Just bear with me a second. Well, listen, I, I, I totally accept that. I, and I'm not for one second that if you are in a position where you're being asked difficult questions not necessarily by patients by the way uh, i'm talking about if you're in a potentially a difficult meeting and and a colleague is is perhaps putting you on the spot or whatever what you're doing is is you're 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 keeping in control of the conversation you're you're not letting it slip away from you so for example you let, all right let me let me put the patient situation to you so, so a patient asks you a really difficult question and you can read into that question that they're really frightened you know they're frightened about a potential diagnosis or, or whatever I say I, I didn't really want to get too much into the medical aspect because I'm not a trained clinician and I and you're going to be given very very good advice about you know talking to patients this is more a general communications issue but if it was that I mean you might say look let me put that into context okay and then it, 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 these are bridging phrases that enable you to, uh, rather than you sitting there and not really looking comfortable, 
it, it enables you to then move the conversation on. Uh, the thing we're focusing on most of all is your treatment or whatever it is. Um, it, it, as I say, I don't want to get too much into the into the patient relationship no, no. because that's going to be for, for you guys to work with. Thanks, Roy. And what, the only reason that this came up really is because something kind of flagged in my mind where it's reflecting on my own practice. And I'm sure I've done it loads of times in my training, if I'm busy in A&E, if I'm stressed and I can't, you know, oh, yeah, 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 we'll do that. And and it's just an interesting, um, it, it's an inadvertent or subconscious application of the theories that you're suggesting for a completely different audience and a completely different thing so it's a, it's a case of making people aware of it in the exams because when the pressure is on I promise you all because we've all done it you will say things in your exams that if you look back in the cold light of day of it you will not believe that you said it um but we will we've got all that fun to come in the next few years so don't worry too much about that for now all right look uh, let's let's um let's get away from bridging and let's deal with negative questions and again I'm I'm not necessarily talking about patient relationships here, but in everyday communication. So if you get a really negative question, you'll, this will, some of this will be familiar. Um, so what you're saying is, you're, how many times have you been on the end of that, that scenario? So what you're saying is, now you, you're, you're already sort of halfway down into getting into a, a, a potentially a conflict situation. So no, what I'm saying is, you don't even have to say no, you can say, what I'm saying is, and then you're on to your answer. Uh, another one that, that is often that often comes up is: Can you guarantee, if you're ever given that one, you know, can you guarantee? Um, uh, what I can guarantee. So as you can see the the, the process at work here. Um, another one that's common is hypothetical if questions. Well, what if such and such? Um, you know, look, we can't see into the future, but what I can say. Uh, and then the unnecessary choice is another one that often gets thrown in. Uh, well, what are you going to put first? Are you going to put your patients first? Or are you going to put your, your hospital first? Um, well, obviously, both are important. But what I can say, so these are all little, I mean, OK, they're, they're, they're not tricks. I mean, they're just ways of, of getting the conversation back under control and stopping it from spiraling into a negative uh, conversation which we want to avoid if we possibly can um so look just a few techniques there but i i just want to finish off now by saying when it comes to avoiding conflict uh if you find yourself in a in a position in the workplace or in even in a domestic situation where you are coming under pressure um you don't have to be a pushover you know, if you are treated unreasonably, then seek sanction, talk to the offending individual, but do it in a calm and polite way. And never, this is key, in front of anybody else. Never get aggressive. Watch your body language. Giving it, uh, I really respect your opinion, while you've got your hand around their throat, uh, doesn't really cut it. It's a, it's a chess game, not a boxing match. And if you do find yourself in disagreement with someone, try restating their supposition without any judgment, such as, well, that's a pile of crap, you know, because uh, obviously, where are you going to go after you've said something like that? Show some respect for their idea if you can. That serves two functions. Firstly, it helps you understand their stated position, but it also signals that you've understood their point. Don't judge it, simply respond with your counterpoint, but deal just in facts. Be hard on facts and the specific problem, never the personalities or the ideas. Sometimes the worst ideas become good solutions when they're kicked around and reshaped. And an another useful technique is to find common areas of agreement. Really, I commend that to you, uh, because usually there'll be something in there. There'll be the kernel of something in there that you can agree with. So build that bridge, you know, um, well, look, I'm with you on that. I'm with you on A and B. Where I differ slightly is C. And then you're, they're likely to be much more receptive to your argument if you, if you approach it that way. Um, and I talked about bridging. I, I want to just go into very briefly into bridges of empathy. Um, this might be more appropriate for what the situation you were discussing earlier, Emma. Uh, thank you for that question is, a, is sometimes overdone. But it, it actually is quite a positive thing to say. So, well, thank you for that question. Um, 
yes, that's that's an important question. Nodding while you're saying, remember body language. Um, that's an interesting point of view. If you don't necessarily agree with it, you could still acknowledge it. That's an interesting point of view. Again, don't overdo it. Uh, if you're really not sure about what somebody's saying uh, and you think they're talking rubbish, you could say, I hear that said a lot. And then you go on to your counter argument or your counter point. Um, I agree with you on X, but on why we've talked about that one. Uh, the empathy bit. I understand why you feel that way. If you're really disagreeing, I understand why you feel that way, especially given, you know, your family circumstances, or especially given this circumstance, whatever it is. So get on the same level as them, get a bit of empathy in there, and hopefully you will carry them with you when it comes to uh, going on from there. You'll have seen, uh, I don't know, you were looking at that um, very brightly coloured slide. Kishan, have you put the slide yeah. up? So it's the, it's, yeah, it's the wheel of emotion. Piece, the wheel it? of emotion. Yeah, this is really good. Um, I want to just talk, I finish off by talking about emotions. Uh, I think if you do find yourself, as you will, getting angry, you might be getting angry at me now, um, and, and losing control of your emotions, develop a strategy for managing that emotion. Uh, it's, this is called emotional intelligence. I mean, it's sadly lacking in much of society today, but you have the opportunity to bring this back. You know, your generation is key to change. We're in a state of great flux the world over, and this is your time. So this diagram, I think, is great. It's uh, it's Robert Pluchek. He's a psychologist. Robert Pluchek's Wheel of Emotion. I don't know if you've seen this before. Um, spent ages doing that lovely, colourful title there. Don't know why. Um, each is very calming. Each of these that you see here, each of these emotions, serenity, trust, admiration, apprehension, fear, surprise, disgust, they're all chemical messengers that work their way through your body very quickly uh, whenever you experience these feelings. And, you know, when people become distressed or depressed, it's often because they're overwhelmed by the cocktail of chemicals that are circulating through their bodies. And understanding these emotions uh, can really help you to start feeling more in control. And one of the most effective ways to do that is to acknowledge which emotions are in play, recognize them, acknowledge them, and verbalize what's happening with these emotions. Um, I mean, it always helps to illustrate your point with an example. So let me give you, give you an example of what I'm talking about here. For many years, I had real problems with authority. Not the good bosses who knew their craft, but the bullies, the inadequate, the incompetent, as I saw them at that time. And it took a, a long time to realize that I was the problem. Why? Oh, because I failed to manage my anger, resentment, hostility, not really understanding what was happening. But eventually I clicked and I understood that my relationship with a, a disciplinarian, overbearing, intense and occasionally tortured father had left its mark. And it was that relationship that was replaying in my mind, sending those negative chemical messages through my body. And once I understood that, my attitude, behavior and outlook, uh, it improved dramatically. So it's just one example of, of how it can have a profound effect on you. So managing emotions is key to being an effective communicator. It's called high character. All successful leaders and champions understand this and use it. Well, there it is. A few ideas, some techniques, hope, some I hope you'll find useful. You are the leaders of tomorrow. Make the effort to develop your communication skills and you'll be great. Well, you'll be great anyway, but you'll just be great a bit quicker. Thank you. Thank very much. you, Rob. That, that's amazing. Um, and bang on time as well. So the reflections and relevance to medicine, which we will come to, obviously dealing with difficult con conversations is going to be a part of your bread and butter. Why you wouldn't want to prepare yourselves now, I'm not really sure. Um, for instance, breaking bad news. Uh, and I'm sure Amelia is going to share next week some, some, I don't know, we haven't planned the session yet, but it wouldn't surprise me if she's got some good examples and some bad examples about how bad news has been broken. Effective consultation skills, whether that be in the virtual or physical world. The bridging, sorry, not the bridging, the message sandwich piece that Rod was talking about. 
um, the importance of that for you presenting at the end of your exams in, in the OSCEs, whenever you do an OSCE, you're going to have to present everything that you've done in 30 minutes, maybe in 30 seconds. So have a think about that structure and how it's going to help you moving forward. And that's the, the presenting piece. There's also communicating in a clinical crisis. When the crash call goes and the adrenaline is pumping, I can remember being told, never run, never run to a crash call. And when I was told that, I thought that's a bit crazy. Sure, I've got to run and be there first. But they said, well, what use are you going to be when you get there? That, that chemical, the adrenaline is coursing through your veins. You're probably out of breath. You're in that fight, flight or freeze mode that we've talked about a lot. So what I would used to do when I had to go to crash calls was I would ring ahead and I would ring ahead and I would chat to somebody who was sensible and say, OK, could you do me a favour? Could you please get the crash trolley? And where is it? Is it unlocked? Is it ready to go? Do you have the paddles on the patient? Is the um, is their chest shaved? All that sort of stuff. So so this is really useful in so many um, areas that you won't see yet because you haven't had exposure to that part of the medical world. And then obviously dealing with difficult people, patients, um, situations, colleagues, uh, which is all a part of everyday life. So what I'd like to do now is uh, just stop the sharing and move to a Q&A with Amelia, Rod and Poppy. Um, and I'd like to ask you how you deal with nerves on air or stress because everybody on the call from a medical student perspective is going to have to operate in that environment and deal with stress and exams. How do you and win trust with interviewees and build rapport quickly? Because again, everyone on the call is going to have to build trust with a patient that doesn't trust them, whether that be for a multitude of reasons. And also, how do you get somebody to open up if they are guarded? So... Uh, should we go with Amelia? Do you want to kind of kick off with some of your thoughts on that? Hello. Um, so to discuss preparing to go on air, I'd say I normally consider five Ps. So the first one's preparation. Obviously, it's really important to give yourself enough time to prepare on the content that you're going to be talking about, going through it, talking it out loud, practicing talking about it out loud. Um, the second one is pep talk. Uh, prep talk. I kind of sort of like to psych myself up into like giving myself a bit more confidence about things, being a bit more enthusiastic, trying to sort of push out those negative connotations that may say, oh, you're not going to get this right. Oh, you might slip over this particular word. Have a just bit more confidence in yourself. Um, positive visualization that it will be delivered well. Um, not thinking, oh, I kept slipping up on that particular word when I was practicing it. Imagine, manifest that it is going to go well for you when you are delivering what it is. Pauses. Um, I think a lot of people, when they're delivering something, they kind of like to think if they've made a mistake, the best way out of it is to rush through the rest of the sentence, um, which is then very obvious that you are then more nervous. If you actually take a deep breath and slow down, really consider what you want to try and say. It is a lot harder to do in the moment, I accept, but taking those pauses can really help you sort of get your thoughts back, kind of plan out what you want to say before you actually say it. And even when I'm reading out loud, um, for instance, on air, I will read it first in my head before talking out loud, rather than reading it word for word as I'm going through the sentence, trying to sort of prepare of what's to come is really important. Um, and then for being in, um, in a live setting rather than radio power start, sort of delivering with confidence in your body language. Um, so having some authority in your voice, but also in the way you want to present it. That's, I'd say, my tips in terms cool. of presenting. Thank you, Amelia. That's, that's amazing. And I think they, those five Ps are equally relevant for all of you when you walk into any exam, whether it be an OSCE, even a patient consultation, I would see that as an exam, to be honest, because if you're taking a history or you're, you're assessing a patient clinically, they are marking you. They might not tell you. They might not give you a mark afterwards like you would in the exams, but they are taking that on board. Um, uh, uh, Poppy, have you got anything to add to those ones, maybe in terms of dealing with on-air stress or dealing with stress in a pressure environment? Agreed with Amelia with uh, what you said there about giving yourself time to prepare, giving yourself a bit of a pep talk. So your body will have a natural response, raised heartbeat, uh, 
thoughts distracted you'll start to think of other things even now for example my my heartbeat my will be higher than what it is normally if I'm sat down just with my partner on the sofa watching television believe you and I that I'm sat here right now with a raised heartbeat that is an absolute given but prior to this I've done my preparation I've thought actually I'm really looking forward to this and with some very friendly people here and know your topic your topic better than anyone else in that room then how can you slip up if you are prepared if you've practiced and also challenge specific worries so so what is it that you're concerned about is it as Amelia said are you concerned about tripping over a word my goodness the last call we had I did exactly just that so of course it went through my mind going gosh am I going to do that again what is the worst case scenario we are human these things happen obviously you would like for that not to happen but ultimately challenge and pinpoint what you're concerned about the most and work on those perhaps concerns. Uh, deep breathing, as cliche and as simple as it sounds, it works. It it's works. not cliche, Poppy. It's, there's a physiological reason why <laughs> that helps. It, 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 exactly. it, 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 it's funny that we, you know, we yeah. almost say that it's cliche because there is, there is biology behind it that helps that happen. And the analogy that I quite like is um, you guys are ducklings. Uh, and you're about to become swans when you're foundation year one doctors in 2026. But the point of this is if you think of a swan or a duckling on the water, a duckling may, may as it's learning to swim, struggle. And you can see that, but that's fine. But as it graduates and becomes a swan, look how calm it is on the surface of the water. And it looks very serene, very elegant. And in your exams, that's exactly what you're going to be like. But under the water, it's paddling away to stay afloat. And it, that is the kind of thing that I'd like you to think about. So when you've built, um, dealt with nerves and on-air stress and you're in that environment, I'd love to kind of get, maybe, I mean, Rod, you've done the most interviews out of everybody here. How do you build that trust and rapport quickly? Uh, well, gosh, I echo everything that uh, Poppy and Amelia have said. Um, but I, I think for me, it's, and, and I guess this is relevant to you if you're going to be a doctor, is uh, that initial meeting, you know, we talk about communication being only 7% about what you say. That initial meeting is all about putting people at ease. And not, I, I don't think that's something that a lot of broadcasters think about enough, uh, particularly earlier in their careers. Uh, you've got to take the time to make people feel at ease. And they walk into that studio instantly, as you said there, Poppy, you know, the heart's going like this you know we we take it for granted because we're doing it all the time mm. but somebody who's doing it for the first or second or third time uh, they're going to be really nervous when they come into the studio somebody who's got a, a health problem coming in to see you they're going to be nervous they're going to be a, a bit apprehensive so taking that 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 it only takes 60 seconds look at them engage with them when they come into the the, the studio or the surgery and smile you know, that's, that smile is so important. And I, again, I see it what happened too often. I mean, in my early days, I, you know, when I was stressed about being in the studio and doing what I was doing and busy uh, with a breakfast show, whatever it was, um, you know, I would forget that. And, and I'd be talking to the producer and somebody would come in and, and I'd suddenly realise there's somebody sat in front of me. It's not an ideal situation. You want to be engaging with somebody when they, as soon as they come into the room. In fact, to, to, as I got to the end of uh, my broadcasting, well, I say the end, I'm on another chapter now, but um, I would actually go out and meet them because, again, it makes them feel important. Rod, I'm so glad that you said that because the, the, the doctors that are the best in their field are the ones that go out and get the patient from the waiting room or at the beginning of the exam and they start their assessment from how that patient gets up from the chair. So although we will teach you do history, do examination, do investigations, get a diagnosis, the best doctors mix it up and they think, okay, I can find out some examination things from this patient by seeing how they get out of the chair. And they walk to them, it was I could assess somebody's musculoskeletal system, neurological system, cardio cardiovascular and respiratory function. We don't teach medicine in that way. So, it, but why should we leave it for 30 years when you guys are consultants and the equivalent to Rod's position now in broadcasting for you to start doing those little hacks and tips and tricks? So I'm so glad that you said that, Rob, because as you were saying it, it was, I just really wanted to mention that. Um, sorry, 
You're going to, no, no, you're I, was, I was just going to say that this engaging with people when they come in, because what you're doing is you're establishing a relationship in the way you look at somebody, you acknowledge them, you, you, you go out and meet them, make them feel, look, you're a human being, you know, and, and I'm pleased to see you. Then immediately you're going to get so much more information out of them when they do actually open up to, to discuss with you whatever it is that, that they want to, to see you about. So We've you start a... in the moment you see them. Thanks, Rod. And we've got a question for you, which is, I have a question for Rod. While on air, how would you approach a question that you do not know an answer to? The audience might infer that that person is not truly competent or knowledgeable as a result. Do you have any tips to prevent this and maintain a good public profile? Uh, yeah, I mean, going back to what I was saying before, the, br <laughs> the bridging uh, statement is, 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 a, is a device. Look, if you've done your preparation, you won't be put in that position, will you? Because you'll have, you'll know exactly what you're going to say. Mm. But if you get a question that you're not expecting and you think, oh, damn, I didn't prepare for that, you may have to be open and honest and say, look, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't know the answer to that. And I would that, encourage that. And I would say it doesn't honest, matter. That is the state. only way to do it. Um, but if, if, if you are prepared for... Uh, something similar along the lines of where that person's going, you might want to move it onto your territory. So you'd use the bridging statement. You'd say, well, thanks for the question or, yeah, I, a good question. And then go on to your, your particular prepared response. Um, so it is about the planning, actually. It's about the preparation. You know, hopefully you will not be in that position because you'll have thought through what the, you know, you'd have anticipated the questions. Um, but uh, yeah, as Christian says, if you really don't know, don't, don't bluff it. Just say, you know what? Um, and I don't know. Speaking completely candidly, the trouble with the current medical education system and process is we almost reward students for pretending that they do know uh, so they can hit all those checklists in the OSCEs. And to say, look, I'm really sorry, I don't know. But guess what? I'll come back. I'll find out and let you know. <laughs> Next time I see you, I'll let you know. Because then when that patient, you see them and you actually, uh, they realise that you remembered that you made that promise to them and that you've actually acted on it and delivered it, your rapport will go through the roof because it's not a common thing uh, that happens. Um, so what I would like to do is ask um, the last question. I'd really like to get people on the call that have done sessions with Poppy, that have done sessions with M in terms of virtual consultations in a clinical world. So... Uh, sorry, yeah, virtual consultations in a COVID world even. And it's about how to getting people open up if they're guarded. So whether, I don't know, Anna, or Lydia, or Lucy, or anybody, anybody who's involved with that, the, the writing up that piece of work that we're doing around virtual consultations, have you got any thoughts? And would you like to put any questions to them? Because the last one we've got is we're just going to briefly talk to both Poppy Rod and Amelia about how to open up an interview if they're guarded, and then that bridges nicely uh, into uh, the virtual consultations piece. So maybe Amelia, you want to go? In terms of you're doing an interview with somebody and yeah. they're really guarded. Yeah, I'd say um, kind of leading off uh, some of the points that Rod made is curiosity, curiosity in the patient, curiosity in the interviewee. Um, not just the idea that you're going into the doctors, you're there for X amount of hours and you're there to just do a job. You're actually interested in what the person has to say. Same with men. I'm being an inter uh, interviewer, not just the fact that, right, go and interview this person because I've got a job to do because I need to meet a deadline by getting this interview and by X time. Is actually having an interest in what their story is. Why am I taking time out of my day to speak to you? Because clearly you must have something interesting to say or why should... You've obviously, to, if it's a doctor, if it's a patient coming to see a doctor, you've obviously taken considerable time and maybe even confidence to come to see the doctor. There must be a real reason why you've come to be here. So you've got to actually be invested in the person in front of you. Um, and I'd also say trying to sort of make yourself see a bit more familiar and relatable, not necessarily going through the same things as uh, the person that's been there, but sort of make having a bit more empathy in your answers, in your reactions to what they're having to say. Um, because as we said, the actual visual reactions and presentation in terms of how you actually meeting someone can play a massive part in how they trust you and how much they actually want to open up to you. If you have a cold guard and you don't really want to have to sort of 
acknowledge what they're really saying and they're not going to want to talk to you I know that I've had to sort of maybe even sometimes if I wanted to get something out of someone maybe they've been a bit nervous talking to me before an interview I've sort of maybe shared a story that's kind of made me a bit more human a bit more relatable like oh I slipped up at this time as well so I understand how you feel or I completely understand because of my experience with my mum or something just trying to sort of make a bit more level just both of you accept that you're not a doctor and a patient you're not an interviewee and an interviewer you're both human you're just having a conversation fantastic thanks Amelia that's amazing uh Poppy or Rod any comments on that so going back to preparation when you're looking to gain someone's trust, it's really important to do your background checks. So just as you would see a patient, you wouldn't allow them to walk in and you have no idea what their condition is. You've got no idea what they might be coming in for. I know with GP appointments, it's a little bit different, but well, in fact, no, you would have some sort of idea as to what they've come to see you about. It's the same with interviews, other interviews. So for example, I will look to see if the person that I'm speaking with has perhaps written a book. Have they been on a trip recently? Are they a family person? And you can either start the conversation with that uh, as an icebreaker, as they say, or it's something that you can go to if you feel that they are guarded. Oh, sorry, didn't you? You recently went away, didn't you? And then it's a conversation starter. And again, it it builds that trust, uh, a bit of familiarity, and engages that person. And it's about them, it's about their life. And also, it's nice for them because they sit there thinking, you've taken that time to invest in me, like Amelia said. Uh, And as I say, it it could be specifically do with the interview or something separate. Uh, One of the best pieces of advice that I was actually given by a broadcaster years ago was to make notes of people that you've met and spoken to. And even with, it's like keeping birthdays for family members, remembering someone's birthday, how many children do they have? Is their children's birthday coming up? Those sort of key points, personal points, are good to know from both sides and often can be an icebreaker if you bring it up and it can actually disarm people even the most guarded people they go oh oh yeah no yes no it was my daughter's birthday oh yes no thank you for asking and all of a sudden you've given yourself an open and in to then talk about what perhaps you want to speak about more whether it is their medical history or the interview that you're doing that's a really good point Poppy thank you and like you know even this morning I think it was like we were chatting yesterday about this prepping it planning it and you sent me a text saying, I hope your grandma's OK. And I thought, oh, that's nice. There's a bit of serotonin coursing through the system. Nice way to wake up. Oh, yeah, I, I completely forgot I went to visit her. I'm probably getting Alzheimer's or something. So not that she has Alzheimer's, but it, that's the whole point. It's that little thing. It's just being nice to each other. And regardless of whether it's in studio or surgery, in the world that we're in, if those little random acts of kindness could actually, if they all build up, they're going to help people out some pretty tough situations that they're in because we all know everybody's having ups and downs at the moment. So I, I would kind of really advocate that just all the time, really. Um, Rod, have you got any thoughts on, on that final piece? No, I, think, that we're I, talking think about? The, I think the ladies have said it all, really. I mean, I, I agree with everything that uh, Poppy and Amelia have said. I think uh, preparation, again, it's down to the preparation of the interviewer in that situ- situation. And I guess if you're going to be the doctor consulting or whatever, um, you, you need to know something about the patient before they walk into your uh, office. And I know with particularly with time pressure, and it's the same in the studio. You know, if you if you've got a lot of time pressure going on, have you done the necessary preparation? Hopefully you have, uh, because then you, you're on you're starting off on the wrong foot if you haven't. And you've got to try and claw it back. Um, open questions is uh, is an obvious one. You know, I think the, the most difficult people to interview, apart from comedians, in my experience, um, is children. Um, and the younger, the more difficult it is to interview them. Um, so you really that's a very good way of disciplining yourself to ask yeah. open questions to get them um, talking. And just thinking back, reflecting back to when I've seen some patients that are children uh, in A&E. I'm not a paediatric doctor. I have no idea. I don't have specialist paediatric training. But there's there's little things like I would, even if they're four years old or seven years old, there's a great um, kind of comment that was made publicly about one of my patients. And I've forgotten the name and I've forgotten the, um, the, the name of the boy, but it's the principal. And the feedback that I got was, Kish, even though he's seven, he spoke to him on a level as if he was an adult. 
Yes. So he sat down on the floor and then started to explore why he felt, not in a threatening way or a bad way, but why he felt it was appropriate and a good idea to stand and balance on a table while eating a packet of crisps. And that is something that we, we also see a lot in people with either mental health issues or learning difficulties. We need to modify the way we communicate with the human being in front of us. And Can that I doesn't, sorry, go on, yeah. No, no, can I, I was just going to say, you, you mentioned my uh, estate agency um, right at the start. I wasn't an estate <laughs> agent, I was a real estate salesman. Uh, subtle <laughs> difference. But um, uh, the great example of, of this, what exactly what you're talking about here, Kish, and, and, and it's important, I think, for you as, as, as would-be doctors, consultants, whatever, is never, ever judge somebody that you've not met. Yeah. Um, I remember being in, a, in, a, in my sales office uh, on a um, on a brand new housing development, very very plush housing development. We were we'd gone top of the range with these houses, very expensive at the time, and uh, this old banger pulled up, and uh, this this scruffy oink got out and and walked into the showroom, and uh, uh, anyway, I sort of looked him up and down. I thought, well, this is a waste of time. And anyway, yeah, it was reasonably pleasant and said hello. Um, but I didn't make any effort to uh, engage, sell, because I just thought, well, this is, this is a waste of time. And you know what? That is probably the most important lesson I ever learned about making assumptions about people, because it turns out he was uh, one of the wealthiest men I'd ever met in the end. Uh, he not only bought one house, he bought four. So, you know. <laughs> You, you you must never make you must never make assumptions about people and 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 do uh, treat them all as equals. Don't don't look down your nose at people because um, you you get it wrong so often. Could so. I also just add in terms of asking questions? Um, one thing I do think is helpful for me when I'm interviewing is to avoid yes no answer questions. Mm. So thinking back into when you're interviewing children, say for instance, you were interviewing a child about schools being closed, asking them a question, are you sad about schools being closed? Most likely a seven year old will just answer yes. It's more asking them, how do you feel about schools being closed? Trying to sort of ensure it's not just a sort of yes, no question because that will then make them consider about how it does make them feel rather than just giving a closed off answer. That's a really good point, Amelia, thank you. And go on, Poppy. That, that's just led me to think of something else. So on top of open questions, I think, Kish, uh, you and I spoke about this previously. As an interviewer, even if you're speaking on a topic that you may know quite well, yeah. you've got to be careful not to put words in someone else's mouth. So, for example, I've, so I work for a lifestyle channel, Health and Wellbeing, and I've had interviews where, or I've or even previously in years gone by, I've interviewed, say, for example, and said... So vitamin C is a water soluble vitamin. I realize that we've got to take this every single day. What's good about it? Or is it good, or is it good for you? Uh, or vitamin C is great uh, to contribute to the functioning, the normal function of the immune system. It's good, yes? <laughs> it's, <laughs> you basically just said everything about it already. So uh, rather than tell me about vitamin C, something <laughs> as short and simple and as sweet as that, yeah. There can often be a fear, particularly if you're just starting out, that you're going to look like you're not knowledgeable, that you're incompetent, when actually being an interviewer, one of the best interviewers are the ones that say the shortest questions and get the longest answers. Yes. So it's a fear. So don't don't be scared of the pause and say, say a little to get back a lot and make them open questions. Yeah, just that's a, such a brilliant point. And, and actually, silence is a real weapon for a broadcaster. Um, you're talking about wanting people to open up uh, or say more. The best way to do it is just to sit back and look at them and say nothing. And I've sometimes, particularly when I want to put somebody under pressure, i.e. a politician, uh, I've just I've sat there for four or five seconds, which is an eternity when you're on air. In the end, they have to say something because... <laughs> Um, you know, otherwise this this is this terrible silence. But actually, from a po positive perspective, it's just a, a, a good technique. You don't have to be speaking all the time. Just yeah. stop, listen. Because to that point, Rod, in a clinical environment, the <laughs> patients come with a list of questions, and they they've prepared, 
we often haven't sometimes we fall into that trap of oh it's a thousand uh, consultations and you know we we have the same problems that you have in the studio but the patients prepare and then as soon as you're sitting there no matter how much preparation preparation they've done that doctor up here patient dynamic here all of that preparation melts away and then as soon as they leave the room they kick themselves so why didn't i see that what so so that sitting back thing think about the body language if i sat there as a doctor my arms crossed four or five seconds look bored look disinterested that's not going to help that patient open up. If I sit back, open body language, nod, smile. Um, right, okay, just think. Um, you want to come in? You're on mute, but sure, go for it. Is there ever um, a situation whereby when someone's come to you with a list of questions, you actually sit there and say, can I just get a pen and write these down so I can make notes as I All go? All the time. All the time all the time and and they also say i say tell me from the beginning what happened and they go how long have you got and i got in a lot of trouble in the nhs for this because i said as long as it takes and um if, I, if that meant i had to sat sit or sit so yeah sit down with somebody for 40 minutes to get to the nub of the issue then i'd do it and if that means that they breach they breach sorry that's you know not my problem um so 100 percent, loads of times um and and also nowadays i actually now that they've got it on their phones I say, can you email it to me? What I'm going to do is I'm going to copy and paste the questions and we're going to structure the whole consultation around what you've come in with um, and then answer them and tick them off. So, yeah. What, why do you ask, Em? I just wonder. Because I'm looking at this from the technological revolutions, what the nub of this um, entire programme is to how to use technology far more effectively to deliver better quality in a shorter time. So it's looking at um, efficacy, if you like. So for me, going into a consultation to be able to send my questions ahead, actually to a doctor, wow, that would be amazing because I go, oh, it's okay, I've already sent it to them. So I can focus on gleaning information. Yeah. It, it's a different diagnostic tool. It's it's adding more things within the patient experience. But um, I'm wondering just how much benefit that would be for doctors as well. Oh, I couldn't agree more, but I think it would be a godsend. Um, but I think there's a slight cultural changing in terms of but yeah, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Um, certainly, I think I'd find it quite useful. So we're, we're starting we're, with fresh minds here. Remember, these are the best that there are ever going to be in this class. I completely agree. Um, <laughs> so we've got like about 120 seconds left before we go off air, as it were. So I'd kind of I'd firstly thank both Poppy, Rod and Amelia for volunteering their time to come and chat to us that whole York Medical School. They didn't have to do this. We haven't paid them. We really, really appreciate it. Um, and then if anyone's got any questions or comments, um, then that's that'd be a good way to end the call, really. But thank you. Thank you. Uh, stop the recording. Yeah.